Jason Forehand, it is such a pleasure to meet you today and to have this conversation on the Your Stories Don't Define You podcast. And thanks to um, Ben Albert for the introduction. Uh, Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's awesome to be here. Uh, I was so excited to chat with you after I looked through your LinkedIn profile and checked out a few of your posts. And um, it just sounds like we are kind of uh, siblings from different mothers or something <laughs> because we have switched and reinvented ourselves so many times. And it's just going to be a pleasure for me to hear about your stories. And also, I know our listeners will be eager to hear all of the different transformations that you've experienced, or not all of them, of course, that would be <laughs> more than 40 minutes. But yeah, yeah. Um, I love the idea that we can transform and change ourselves, change our lives without um, having to lose our core values, that we can be authentic wherever we are, as long as we are comfortable in our skin. And Absolutely. Uh, I know that's where we're going to go with this conversation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I always begin these episodes by asking my guests to share something about themselves that most people don't know about them. You know, it's not on your LinkedIn profile. Maybe you've said it here and there, but most of your current circle might not know this about you. Well, we, you know, like we were talking before the, the record, I have talked about the fact that I am a musician and that I've played out and you can hear some of my music if you if you dig into the featured post and you look at those videos if you actually read the featured post you'll see some of those stories but like what we were talking about previously I played with a big band and we didn't make a dime all the money we made went back into our recording studio and and equipment stuff but it was a big band with horns and keyboards and bass and percussion and it was so much fun and we did 60s and 70s rock and jazz and uh blues and i had so much fun and like i told you one of the cool things that i experienced there was the, i was a chef at the time as well and one of the restaurants that i worked at uh allowed us to play on a thursday night and they never did really any business on a Thursday night, but we packed the place out and it was the busiest uh, he had been in the 10 years since he had opened the restaurant. And it was so great to see so many people coming in and out and being interactive and dancing and having fun. But this music, when you go back into the, you know, our history of music, there's so much great music out there, it, you know, and rock and blues and jazz and funk and soul and and especially that time period, 60s and 70s. And I'm a 70s kid. Uh, so I I love it. And I was just it was like a kid in a candy store being able to be the vocalist and percussionist, mm -hmm. because these even though I play multiple instruments, these guys played I like played much better than I was. They were much more talented than I was. So I let them do all that. They did their thing. And I just enjoyed the heck out of it. So, well, you know, before I hit record, you mentioned uh, your drummer, Miles, and I immediately went to uh, that same sensation of being surrounded by phenomenally talented people and having that honor of thinking, oh my gosh, they, they're playing with me. Like they're, yeah. They believe in me. And we have a, a musician here in Montana, Ken Nelson, whose father, Blackie Nelson, was like the jazz guitarist of his time. And uh, we lost him a few years ago, but I had the opportunity to sing with him. I sang the Mama Cass version of Dream a Little oh. Dream. Oh. And his oh. guitar and his leads were just extraordinary. And he was in his 80s at the time. And yeah. he would he would sit, you know, and all the other musicians other than the, other than the drummer, of course, were standing. But um, I would just... Every time I'd get the opportunity to be on stage with him and performing, I would just get this eagerness and fear and imposter syndrome. And then it would all disappear the moment I started hearing him play. Yeah. And he and his son, Ken, is also, oh my gosh, phenomenally talented. And every time I perform with him, I have that, I have to work harder. I I have to really bring it. And I'm 
and he's like the most gentle and humble soul. Yeah. Like there's none of the the ego that you would expect from somebody that talented. Yeah. And every time I'm like, oh my gosh. And every time I feel like I step up because he's there. It almost so forces me, you to. Yeah, it forces you it to does. because in your mind you're like, I, I can do this. You you know you convince yourself, oh I'm I'm gonna get through this. I can do this. But at the same time, you're like, I need to do this. I've got to rise up. And uh, yeah. I, you, all right. So we're going to trade music. I'm going to send some MP3s to you. You're going to send some MP3s to me. And Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So that's fantastic. Yeah. So you were a chef at the time. And what happened to make you leave being a chef? Well, this is really, you know, I'll give you the real small version of this. So all of my family, I'm from a very large Irish family. All of my family, with the exception of me, so all of my brothers, I'm the oldest of six, all of my brothers, my father, everybody, and even some of their family members, uh, my brother's wives, etc. they're all in the fashion industry. So I'm this goofy kid that's creative. I was always doing music and stuff like that. Even in uh, high schools, I was part of the tryout uh, choral groups that went out and made money because there's no money for arts. Listen, right. people, you need to put money into the arts for schools. Um, so there was no money for the arts in schools and that included the choral programs. So we would go out and sing to the rotary clubs, et cetera, for donations to help, um, you know, fund our programs and stuff. And that was a tryout only group. And we'd get to leave school and go do our thing and sing our, you know, our, our little songs of, six part harmony and whatnot. So I grew up being creative and I just love food. I'm a foodie at heart. There's very few things that I don't like. I'm, I'll try anything at least once. And uh, so I grew up being very interested in that realm, taking some classes, getting involved. I had some fantastic chefs that put me under their wing. And so I, I just love that. I was at a place where I was an executive chef. I had built my career up to where I was worthy enough to take the reins and do all the work. Um, and one of the reasons that happened is because I believe in people over everything else. And because I do, I find better people that stay longer, that I pour into, and they believe in me, I believe in them, we help each other grow. So my teams were always stronger. And in an industry that has super high retention, I was able to have 50 to 60% less than not only the state, not only other restaurants around us, not only the local city, it was just, we, we formed teams, we formed bonds. So we stayed longer at places. I had two restaurants in a row that closed down, one the first year, one after a year and a half. And that's pretty typical. 75% of all new restaurants close within the first two years. And there's a multitude of reasons for that. Uh, and that's a figure from pre-COVID. I don't know, know what it is now. Um, so I was really burned. I got really fried and... I took that experience and did my first transition. And my first transition was going from selling food to selling clothing. So all my family is super happy. Now you're on the path. You're, you're like going towards where we are. And I, I put this as an aside. As a kid, I learned to play hockey and sew at the same time. So how many kids can say that? That, you know, they... <laughs> I learned how to darn socks and sew my own buttons as a kid, as I was learning how to play hockey. You can Where see was all this? the hockey scars. Uh, New York. Well, yeah. I grew up all over the place. We, I have lived in 17 states, 42 cities in 57 years. Uh, and so a lot of that was as a child. Um, my dad moved around for different businesses. There were multiple times where he was, you know, the sole parent. And so we had grandparents and other people that were helping us out uh, to watch us if he had meetings or he had to go out of town. But my dad was a really hard worker. And so that kind of instilled a lot of things in us. And my first transition was moving from food because, again, I had gotten burned out. I, I had poured everything into these two restaurants and things beyond my control happened. Mm -hmm. 
And I was tired of that. I didn't want to spend all this time and energy and focus and then have it go away because someone else made mistakes. I, right. the, the last you don't place want to that, fail for somebody else's yeah, errors. The last right. place I didn't even get a, I didn't even get a paycheck. I got a whole bunch. I got, here's some charcuterie and some wine. Here's your paycheck. I'm like, okay, great. You know, so that doesn't help you pay rent. Um, mm -hmm. so, so I transitioned over and I actually was really good at retail. I joined a couple of different companies, moved my way up quickly into a district manager role and then a regional manager role. And I, this just like blew up quickly. I was like, and it was all really because of my approach to people, how I treat people, how I believe in people, how I surround my pe myself with great people that are better than me in a lot of things. And so recognize, removing your ego and your biases to recognize you need people that are better than you and can help you grow as a person and as a business person, but also add so much value. So if you can add value to them and you can pour into them and you care about them, guess what? There's this crazy rippling effect. It affects their them, their the other people in your work, the, their families, the communities, it's insanity. And so I learned this early on about how this how it has impact and it catapulted my career, uh, which ended up transitioning, oddly enough, uh, into human resources. And I took classes and uh, especially in psychology and things of that nature, really no human resources classes, more about human beings. You know, mm -hmm. um, I was learning everything online when I had a, when we got to that place where I could do that and start taking free classes about human resources. And then that was like the next thing I combined. The, the next transition was combining human resources and my service industry work into these director and higher positions where, hey, now I'm in charge of people that are in multiple countries, multiple states. I have, you know, brick and mortar and I have online businesses. And, you know, how do we communicate with people that are remote or in, in other areas? And, you know, how do you add value and keep people engaged when they're not sitting across the desk from you and you can shake their hand and see that they're hurting? How do you how do you make those things happen? So it was a great learning curve. I made a lot of mistakes, but I learned early on in my life because my grandparents were missionaries and traveled all over the world. So I learned early on, you put your hand up and you take the onus for all your mistakes. You put your hand up, you say, I goofed. You take all of that that you, you know, you take anything <laughs> that comes from that and mm -hmm. you learn and you unlearn and you relearn and you grow. And people will respect the heck out of you for doing it. It will change your trajectory and it will bring about a change in those people around you as well. So those are- Because if you're willing to take it, then they may be willing to own up to their own errors absolutely. and, and they, learn from it. They understand it's a safe place to fail forward. Mm -hmm. That's exactly. That really is, are you creating a safe space for people to fail forward and to ask tough questions and to challenge you? Or are you like, oh, don't talk to me like that. You know, it's- you know, it, I have to I have to interrupt for a second. I remember this conversation with a former boss where I said uh, he asked me what I thought about this was um, a government agency. And he asked me what I thought about um, opening up Facebook to our employees because they had ha they had blocked the site on everybody's oh, computers. Yeah. And I said, well, yeah, you need to just open that up and not have that blocked. And he said, well, I don't want somebody like uh, this admin person to spend all day on Facebook. And I said, look, if you're worried about distraction, we have phones and we have all kinds of other opportunities to be distracted. If, if it's a distraction problem, that's a management problem. That's not the distraction that's causing a problem. And at the end of the conversation, he said, 
well, I guess we'll just agree to disagree. And I looked at him, the big smile on my face. I said, yeah. well, you asked me. You yeah. you did ask me. He's like, oh. and he walked away. So we had a very complicated relationship because he continued every once in a while to ask me. And then he would do the same thing every time. And at one point, he asked me another one of these weighted questions, which I knew I knew how it was going to end. We had this pattern going. Mm -hmm. And I said, are you really asking me, do you actually want to hear my opinion here? Because the last few times I've said something, you've just walked away disgusted and with in full disagreement. So if you actually want to hear it, I'll, I'll share. But if you're just kind of saying that to be a good boss or something, I don't even want to go there. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> you're not even... You know, it's almost like the box checking stuff that's going exactly. on right now. That's exactly You're what it checking is. a box to say, oh, I talked to you about this. No, you disregard. You came in with a preconceived notion and you disregarded from the moment I opened my mouth. You disregarded everything that I had to say. So why are we talking? <laughs> that's exactly what it was. And he said, no, I really want to hear it. I said, OK. If yeah. you just dismiss what I have to say, I'm never going to share my opinion with you oh, again. Yeah. It's just oh, not yeah. going to happen. But luckily, we had enough of a, a respectful relationship that he, I could talk to him like that. Although I can tell you that it definitely was hard. We had yeah. some really complicated stuff going on in there. But I anyway. can only imagine. I can only imagine. Yeah. So when you um, when you think about your current work and how you've gotten here to where you are. I would love for you to share with our audience a story um, of something that happened recently in your work that you can attribute to what you learned from the past. So it's basically telling us what you do without telling us what you do. So it's story form. Does that work sure. for you? Yeah. Okay. In 2020, when the world was on fire, not only socially, politically, but COVID was mm -hmm. rampant. Uh, I had the year before left corporate America to take my little HR business to the next level. And I was thriving. All of my clients were clients that were people like me. They were service industry warriors. They were the mom and pop grocery stores and dry cleaners and restaurants or restaurateurs with maybe two, three restaurants that every other HR company ignored because it's it's a lot more it's work. Yeah. It's, it's a lot more work to, to get those mom and pop places and help them out than it is to get the company that's got, you know, thousands of employees and you can monetize that in your brain. And I I didn't think like that. I thought it's, about... It seems to me that's rarely sustainable too. Like when you go into the big companies, they'll pay you a lot of money, but your impact is probably not going to be the same. Yeah, I don't, you know, I couldn't tell you because <laughs> that's never been my shtick. Uh, <laughs> and, and even the places where I was in corporate weren't those huge type companies. Oh. <laughs> so, you know, even though I've had a lot of employees that I've been part of, um, you know, or I've been part of their lives and, and I was responsible for in my past. I think uh, at one point as a regional manager, before I transitioned to director type roles, I had over a thousand employees that I was responsible for because I had all of the East Coast. But even in that, yeah, that was a different thing because I was technically a regional sales manager. So I was, it was about driving brick and mortar sales within mm -hmm. um, the places that we had all over the United States, you know, on the Eastern seaboard. But this, you know, your question, I, I was helping mom and pop places with their HR needs because that was near and dear to me. And I grew up doing that because the restaurants that I was part of growing up, they didn't have HR. You right. know, there was no HR department in the 70s for, you know, Joe's Pizzeria. Down, no, Joe made the decisions and that was just how it was. 
and Joe would take you out to the dumpster and have a come to Jesus meeting with you. And that's how he dealt with, you know, having an HR, HR conversation. Problem, right? yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So learning along those ways, COVID comes, all my clients are crushed. I'm in New York at the time. I had clients in New York City, Westchester, all over my area. I was based in Westchester, New York, and they were pummeled. They were destroyed. Most of them, over 80%, 80% of them did not come back, did not survive this. Because unlike what everyone tells you and what you see in the media, those checks that you know, New York state and the federal government were saying, Hey, we're going to, we're going to help you small business guys out. Don't you worry. I got my first one. So this happens January, you know, everybody's shut down. There's craziness. My first check arrived at the end of July. So how do you survive? How do you survive? You have no income. You have nothing coming in. You have no clients anymore because they're all in the same place you are. And the government that's here to help you has left you out to dry. And all those all those initiatives to keep creditors off of you, et cetera, none of that was working. They were like all sitting here with their hands out going, why aren't you paying us? And I'm like, uh, have you watched the news? Have you seen what's going on in the world? And so, yeah, it was a struggle. It pummeled me. Um, financially, uh, spiritually, emotionally, uh, and watching my friends, my family, these people that I, that my clients to me were like family and watching them all struggle. I was, uh, and then seeing losses personally, having, you know, people that, that perished during this, not only my family, but friends and people I knew. So seeing this tragedy and then seeing the other things going on in the world, uh, I started really doubling down on doing pro bono work and trying to help nonprofits and then readjusting my mindset as to how do I want the world to look and how do I want to spend the last portion of my life what do, I, what do I want to do with the last portion of my life and how do I want to make an impact? I've had periods of time in my life where even though I cared about people, I still cared more about, you know, how much money I made and what my position was and chasing what the world tells you are supposed to be success monitors. You know, they're these, these marks of success. And if you don't have this and you don't do that, then you're not successful. And I bought into that early on in my life and career. And there was this juxtaposition of, you know what, now that's not true anymore. And I don't see the world that way. And so it really had an impact on me personally and where I wanted to go from here on out without any delay, without any, without any real idea of the direct, the direct path, but mm -hmm. knowing that I needed to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And um, what was the a client at that time that you took on maybe pro bono, that you realized that you were right, that this is, this is what you were meant to do, or that just at, at least gave you that confidence that you were going to make an impact and that you made the right decision? I took on, I, in, in my past, I had all, I have done volunteer work since I was a kid. And I have, even as a, even in my culinary days, I would, there were two different nonprofits where I would teach culinary school and be part of a training program for people that have, were formerly incarcerated that had fought, um, addictions and were at a place where they were ready to empower themselves, et cetera. So I already had this idea in my head early on that, that giving back and, and giving to people and giving to organizations that were helping people was a great thing. And I think one in particular in 2020, I think it was 2020, one in particular nonprofit that I helped them revamp 
all of their policies, procedures, talk about engagement, look at DEI strategies. They decided that they were going to really do the work. And I, I met with the, the owner, or not the owner, but the executive director, the, the founder, uh, one of the board directors, and um, a couple other people before I even agreed to start doing the work. Because it's massive. It's a massive amount of work to revamp all of that for a thriving nonprofit. And they're smaller in scale to what other people consider size size and nonprofits goes by like how much income, you know, how your funding and the number of people you have on board. And so they're they're a small to medium size nonprofit. And they had such an impact. They're out of Portland, Oregon, and they had such an impact on their community and the people around them. And I don't know if you know much about Portland, but there's a lot of homeless in Portland. And Mm -hmm. so there are a lot of issues that need to be addressed. And they were trying to tackle some of these things. Not only did they offer some sort of food assistance to people, but they offered free financial classes and let's help empower you to get a, to get ahead of this because that's what you want. I want, I feel like, and and this just has stuck with me for many, many years, but I going back to my training and that's why going back to, to working for a nonprofit where we taught people stuff. I believe that the only way to conquer poverty, homelessness, and some of the socioeconomic issues that we have is to empower people and help them get on firm footing so that they can move forward. Um, because I just don't see it in, in government assistance and what is happening in the world for whether it's, you know, economic relief or whatever, that's not the answer. We're going to just keep cycling and we're never going to solve any issues. Um, We're putting band-aids on problems. So Mm -hmm. empowering people to move out of their circumstances and to help them mentally and physically and financially grow to other levels is how we're going to, we're going to stop some things and we're going to move the needle forward. Right. So interrupting the cycles. Yeah. You've got to be a disruptor. You know, you've got to, mm-hmm. it's not just about awareness because everybody's aware that it happens, you know, the, mm-hmm. there are issues, but taking that awareness to a disruption phase where you're like, what can we do now that's going to really move the needle? How do mm-hmm. we, how do we create actionable, equitable change that moves the needle in a positive direction? So that's what has transitioned me into this final stage of, uh, you know, act, act seven or whatever it is of, you know, what are we going to do now? You know, and it's something that I can do for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. And it's something that feeds my soul really makes, I don't feel like it's work. And I, I work a ton of hours doing this, but I don't even feel like it's work. Um, mm-hmm. We don't have, we have three board directors. Uh, It's me, myself, and I as the founder, executive director. None of us are getting paid yet, but we are financially stable from the standpoint that we pay all our bills now with our donations. And now we're looking at the next level. How do we, and this is quick. I mean, we just started in, I mean, we just started in April. Like we just started with conversations and getting the board together in April. It only took us six weeks six weeks from filing our 501c3 to the IRS to get our approval back. When I say that to other nonprofits, they go. That's huge. Like they just fall out. (laughs) It could take six months or longer. It's nothing. They're like, Jason, don't, don't be surprised if it takes you six months and they have other questions because you're selling air. You're you're doing it. You have a movement. You're not, you're not helping kids in Africa. You're not doing something that is a specific, you know, I want to empower the Latino community and here's how I'm doing. You are helping everyone, which is way too broad. And you are basically selling air. You're, you're creating a social movement with your actions. So, I mean, how do you even monetize that? 
I get this question. I get this question like I can't even tell you how many times a week. You know, like, mm-hmm. well, how are you fundraising and how do you write grants and how do you, you know, what, how do you describe this? And I refer back to every powerful movement that's ever been done in our history by any race. It's a group of people that believe in a common direction of disruption and are going to move the needle. Movement in its in that word itself means action. You, you can't move without creating action. So we have 40 plus partners and are moving in a, a direction of change and moving the needle. In terms of improving workplaces. Really imp- improving workplaces by affecting leadership behaviors. So mm. you think about what is the root cause of having pyramids. And having that boss that you talked about that, you know, disregarded your, you know, everything you said in your opinions. Pretty much. You know, workplace toxicity that is such a huge conversation piece. And that tipping point in 2020 of diversity, equity, inclusion, where now now we see two years later that people still checking boxes still just doing what they have to so they can say, hey, you know, I'm doing the work. No, you're not. You're not doing the work. You you're know not, what you, you're not creating change. What you said about that first nonprofit that you were working with out of Portland, what struck me was what you said at the very beginning of the story, which was they were ready to do the work. Yeah. And that's that's what really struck me because those are the clients that I love to take on. Amen. And I think one of the biggest mistakes we make is taking on the clients that aren't ready to do the work. And then we're banging our heads against the wall and it's not helpful. And what was hard for me early on coaching people and teams was that um, sometimes like an individual would come to me and say, I want to change this. I'm, I'm sick of this. I'm so stuck, blah, blah, blah. And then I'd give them two tiny little tasks to do before our next session, like literally 15 minutes twice a week, tiny tasks, just, just to move the needle, right? Mm -hmm. Movement. And they'd come back to me and say, Oh, I just didn't have time. Or I just wasn't inspired, didn't have the time. Or, you know, I was so tired from work. Yeah. So one client I had to fire after three sessions, I said, we're going to have the same conversation a year from now. And I'm not willing to put in all that time and take your money for something you're not ready to do. And here's Good the thing. for you. You're going to regret this. In a year, you're going to say, I wish I had started a year ago. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then maybe a year after that, you're going to do the same thing again. Yeah. So um, until you're ready to actually choose not to face regret, I, I, we're done. And I love you and come to me when you're ready. And she was so insulted. And a year later, I ran into her because it's a small town here in Montana. The whole state (laughs) is a small town with a very long main street. I lived in Kalispell. I lived in Kalispell. Um, I ran into her and I said, how's that going? I mean, have you? And she's like, oh, yeah, I've been doing this and that. And none of it was things that were going to take her out of what she was in, which is something that was making her miserable. And I've had the same experience um, in government agencies when I bring StrengthsFinder to their teams and they call me in and I know it's just a flavor of the week. And But I go in mm-hmm. and, and here's what I said the last time. And this is why that comment resonated so much with me. When I went in for the last group, it was about 30 people in a government agency. And I knew the leader was in, like she was sitting there with them, but her <laughs> leaders were not. Yeah. So there's no way this is going to be sustained as an agency within their team. It'll be sustained. She's already reached out to me and said, what's next? What can we do next? And she's ready to invest in her people to try to keep them because turnover is so bad right now. Mm -hmm. And um, at the end of our session, I said, look, for your overall agency, this is a flavor of the week. This is a band-aid. But for you, this can be sustained as an individual, as a team with your colleagues, with your family, you can take what you learned today and in our one-to-one about your natural talents, what your magic is when you bring it and where you get in your own way. You can take all of this 
and change lives, starting with your own. In That's awesome. In your communication. But this is up to you. It's not up to your agency to sustain this. Yeah. And I think there's something to be said about that because there's so much talk about leaving companies that are toxic or that have that are not fulfilling you personally and we see you know what's the last figure something like 4.7 million left left their jobs left perfectly good jobs even though there's still millions what is it something like six plus million people that are either unemployed or don't even get caught up in the system because they've been unemployed for six months or more so they don't show up in the in the numbers but over six million people still looking for jobs and you decide in this debacle this dumpster fire of talent and hiring you decide i am so unfulfilled and so unhappy i'm willing to go out and leave a perfectly good job and jump out into the waters of the unknown because i'm so unhappy that's i mean a, and it's it tragic happening it it's keeps tragic. happening but so your your statement to her of like hey you know what you can create change where you are but understand please please know and i hope you do know that they're not going to support you up above but you can control what you can control and do the best you can to control that uh until you can't anymore until mm -hmm. they shut down i took my first unassociated client in my little HR company in 2012. I never lost a single client until 2020 with the pandemic, but also I had never turned down a client until 2020. And in 2020, when I desperately needed money and was getting pummeled, one of these companies that was not a nonprofit reached out and, you know, like everybody else who was on fire, we've got to do all these things. We've got to put all this in place. We've got to do this right now. It's got to happen right now. And somehow through a friend of a friend, I, I get a phone call with this person and they're like blowing smoke up my skirt, telling me how wonderful I am and how, how, you know, I can feel like you're going to make a change and whatnot. And so I, I, end up having a con uh, let's, let's let's have a one-on-one -on -one conversation i'll come to you we'll meet and you're in the city and i've got another client that's there I, i'll come and we set up a time and i meet with him and he's on his phone like most of the meeting that i'm with him one-on-one -on -one, and this is why i wanted to meet with him uh, during most of the meeting he's on his phone mm -hmm. yeah 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 okay yeah all that uh. oh good sorry i can <laughs> I can tell that, and maybe this is some of the behavioral psychology stuff that I took. I can tell that everything I'm saying is like this green gas going in one ear and going right out the other. I can just see that you are not going to do anything. I'm going to do all this work. You're going to pay me this crazy amount of money, which I really could use, but you're not going to do anything. You, you don't even care what I'm saying. You don't care about any of your people. You don't care. You just you just want to make yourself to the public look like you're doing oh, the right hey, thing. Hey, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I don't even know what those three words mean, but we do it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it was the first time in my life that I didn't take a client, and man, I needed I needed it. <laughs> I needed it. And I still was like, nah, that's not no, happening. Because I think not you have only, to have integrity. Well, yeah. And not only are you going to walk away totally dissatisfied, no matter how much work you do, no matter how much money you get from it, you're going to walk away totally dissatisfied. And you're going to feel like you failed his people, which you actually care about them. And that's that's where that's where the rubber meets the road, is that's the integrity. Like I don't I don't want to get into this conversation or into this project where i'm going to tell all these people things are going to change and then nothing changes that's just not okay i i will tell you sarah even more so than that i knew that i had to look at the person that was facing me in the mirror and that was going to bother me even more than any of that other stuff 
Exactly. Yes, those things are true that you just said. And I would feel, even though I had not met the team, I would feel afflicted and, and compromised. Uh, but I would not feel good about the person that I'm looking at. And I, my goal in this part of in stage of my life is each day to be a better person than I was the day before to learn, unlearn and relearn and grow and move in a forward direction, fail forward. Cause I make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> I make a lot of mistakes uh, on a daily basis. You know, you're running a, you're running a 501 C three. You know, I don't have all the answers. So my goal is to be a better person than I was the day before. And I have to be able to look at that person in the mirror and not be disgusted and feel good about the human being that I am. And, and that is more valuable than any amount of money. So I have to ask this question too. I think a lot about the fact that we're often preaching to the choir. Mm. Um, <laughs> my friend, Heather Younger, uh, has written a few books and the recent one that's coming out in early, I think in early 2023 is the, the art of active listening. Mm. And um, we were talking about the title back in March at the no longer virtual event, where we get a bunch of people together that met on LinkedIn. We meet face to face, we learn together, we grow together, a bunch of entrepreneurs and innovators. And she's like at, over a couple glasses of wine, let's brainstorm the title of my next book. Nice. <laughs> so yeah. we're going through it. And, and I'm, I am a very practical person. So I'm like, well, what title can we use that will actually get the attention of people who need to read it? And she said, here's what my publisher said, write for your audience. Because those people that need to read it are not going to read it. Write for your audience. And it just broke my heart. It's true. It's absolutely true. So I would love to know if you've had an experience where you were able to actually get somebody who needed to hear your words, who needed to understand what leadership was and how it would benefit him and his organization and his people, but him in particular or her. Have you had a success story like that where you've you've gotten through that wall? I don't know yet. I mean, I'm going to answer honestly. I'd love to. I'd love to regale you with a story of of success in that fashion. But I'm thinking, and I'm well. Well, you know what? I'd have to go back to. There are success stories that are smaller, and every victory Everyone is matters. should be. It right. should be. You know. I don't care what size it was. The, in in my culinary work. There was, I'm gonna, there's a particular, I was responsible for two restaurants. They were in two different locations uh, that were miles apart from each other, two very different clientels. Um, and it was speaking to my heart. It's Cajun Creole. I love Cajun Creole. I'm a big fan of Emerald Lagasse, uh, one of my heroes. And so Cajun Creole was kind of my jam. And there were two restaurants, so I was the head guy and responsible for both. That's ordering and all of this. There was a young man that I brought on, and he was from the streets and had a lot of good common sense, but he really struggled with other things. And I just saw the value of this human being, and I, st I could see his face still to this day. And he thrived on beyond even after I left the organization. I came up with different programs to honor the people that we brought on and to reward them. And one of the things was that these guys couldn't afford some of the chefy type stuff. So out of my own pocket, I would buy them really nice chef coats. And I would have embroidered their name on the chef coat. I would, I would embroider one for them. And it would be for a period of like, all right, when you work for me for six months, you would get your own chef coat with your name on. You want to know how that lit people up. You have no idea. Then as you did certain stations, like you learned 
from fry to salad to, you know, what you Dessert, learned all the, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. you learned all the different stations. I would give you just like the military, I would give you chevrons. So you would get these things that I would take your coat and I would have this embroidered on the side and you'd have these chevrons for like, I look at me, look, I, I have all of this, you know, it was pride. empowering and prideful. And then when they reached a year with us, I got them a second coat and I had all of their, all of their stuff done on the side, had their name on it. So now they had an even nicer coat that had the same stuff. I didn't have to take that from them to keep putting the chevrons on. They, and this particular gentleman had only worked at a, at like a, fast casual restaurant he was not in a full service this was these were high-end restaurants you know we had the whole gambit we had wine list it was it was an extraordinary process he grew by leaps and bounds because he saw he was in a place where he was safe that he could fail forward and he made mistakes I mean, I think of a Friday night where he put us in the weeds because he completely spaced on an order and confused some things, even in his position. And when one position goes down in flames on a Friday night, when you've got tickets all the way down the wheel, you're you're in trouble. So having to dig him out, then having to get him to calm down, then having to have him learn from that and from those mistakes and then move forward. That was huge. And so exactly. for me, like, that having that impact on a young man who saw, who came from nothing and actually got to see this happening and then was able to move forward himself. And after I left, ended up moving into a sous chef position because he was ready for it. I recommended him, didn't uh -huh. know if they would do it, but I heard afterwards he, you know, called me right. and said, Hey, I got the sous chef position. He started as oh. a guy working part time, you know, and he grew into this. But it's how you value your people and how you create the situations and the circumstances where they can grow at their own pace, feel safe and fail forward is is immensely rewarding, not only to them, but to you. And it impacted the restaurant because we kept people we at both the restaurants. We kept people mm -hmm. insanely longer than anyone else around us, which is huge. And I think one of the things that helps move that dial, move the needle for people who are not the believers is when you show them the the bottom line, the impact on the bottom line, when you keep people and you don't have to keep training people. Um, and I, I've that's how I've gotten to move the needle a little tiny bit with with those with the ones that need to hear it is simply by um, encouraging them to think about what it what the big impact is in terms of turnover the cost um, the amount of time that goes into not just finding somebody but training them and worse the people who don't feel safe and they aren't bringing their whole selves at the cost of that is huge that they're hmm. just doing the minimum to get by and i've heard people say well they're getting paid they should just do their job and i'm like well they are just uh -huh. doing their job they are just doing their job and that's all you're getting from them. You're right. They should just do their job uh, and they are. And, uh, but what if you want them to actually be innovative? What if you actually want them to care about their work? It, think about how much more you get from them. Yeah. They're, so, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's actually proven there. I mean, people a lot smarter than me have put into financial reports uh everyone from harvard to other companies have put into documentation that's out in the public what the cost of turnover is on an organization oh, yeah. and what how taking care of people and paying them a living wage uh -huh. will have a financial impact on your bottom line 
to the positive. Positive. Exactly. I, I just read this. So I, my, um, my uh, certification in the Gallup StrengthsFinder tool gives me access to all kinds of great information from Gallup and anyone can access it, but I access it regularly because that's what I do with teams. I do the StrengthsFinder stuff. And um, I remember just recently seeing even a mid-level manager making like 50,000 a year or so, even somebody like that can cost every position can cost over a hundred thousand dollars. A hundred thousand dollars, the cost of that turnover of a mid-level manager. And you think about government agencies, they go through them, they churn through them just like a restaurant. I mean, it's just like a restaurant in some parts of of our government agencies because people are promoted to their level of incompetence and they're not leaders, they're managers and people work for them and that's all they do. (laughs) They work for them. So um, let's, let's come full circle. I keep thinking back about our initial conversation about music because, you know, we're both musicians and it just makes me happy to talk to somebody who's also a foodie and a musician. One of the things you said, you're like, you could, you still can see the face of your drummer, Miles. You can, when you think about that time, you think about a particular band and you've been a musician for a long, long time, but a particular band that brought you great satisfaction and joy in working with them. So I'd love for you to just share um, a a moment of time in that experience. Like maybe it's that night that you were at the restaurant where the chef said, or where the owner said, I've never had a Thursday night so busy in 10 years. What is a moment that you can take away from that that actually really informs your behavior now? Well, I I think there's a couple of things, but one stands out probably more than any of the others. And that's never give up. Um, You don't know what you're going, you know, we didn't know how many people were going to actually show up. You never know when you, when you do a gig and you know, you're not some named person, you don't know who's going to show up or how they're going to show up or, or what's going to happen. But you do the things you do because you love doing them and you have crazy faith goals that you're going to empower people and you're going to uh, find that joy in what you're doing because you love what you're doing and you see the value of sharing it. So for me, it's that never give up, never surrender you know, uh, the Galaxy Quest uh, guy. I Never love give up. That movie. Never surrender. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, just marching forward to do the things you love and be the person you want to be doing what you love. Mm, I love that, Jason. It reminds me of both the good gigs and the bad gigs because. As you were telling this story about being there and having it packed and the energy that the audience was sharing with you and the energy that that brought you to give to the audience, I, I've had gigs like that where I'm singing a cover like White Rabbit and everybody's just silent. And at the end, they just flip out and the yeah. crowd goes wild. And then you brought me back to another moment where um, I, I was performing and we were um, kind of background music for a silent auction for a big event. And we performed the song Black Coffee. I sang it. Um, Julie London's version is my favorite. Oh, okay. I was going to ask which one. I was going to ask you which <laughs> yeah. one. I was like, I'm thinking and I'm thinking of the band. And that was like Paul Carrick and his. And, and, yeah, yeah, well, Peggy Lee did it and she nailed it. But I, I always thought Julie London's version was the best. But I remember we f- we finished that song, absolutely nailed it. Is this awesome jazz group, and crickets, not a single clap, and it didn't matter because, as you said, we were doing this for us. This was something we loved, we believed in, and I knew people could hear it, and it was just an awkward situation, but. If I was waiting for the audience response, I would not have found that magic. I would not have found the beauty in the moment. And in some ways it felt like, oh, well, that's okay because we're practicing. You know, every time we do a song, we're getting better at it. And, but the moment that was really meaningful to me was turning around 
and looking at our drummer, who's also just such a, an amazing musician. And he smiled. He gave me this big grin. And he goes, that's the best we've ever done that song. Nice. Nice. So you're right. You can't yeah. give up. You just do what feels right. And eventually, I mean, you have to have faith that it's going to have an impact. And you just keep on, keep on keeping on. <laughs> Jason, thank you so much for joining oh, me today. My pleasure. My this pleasure. This has been great. So um, just for our listeners, and I'll have all this information, links and stuff on the website, elkinsconsulting.com on the podcast page. So all the show notes will include these links. But Jason, tell me um, how people get a hold of you, um, what exactly you're looking for. How can we support you? Well, I, you know, with the nonprofit, uh, which is easily HR hyphen for you, the number four, the letter U.org. You know, our mission is to remove the roadblocks that prevent people from finding living wage employment. And we do that by highlighting leaders, authors, podcasters, um, employers of all sizes, solopreneurs, coaches, consultants that are breaking down barriers in their work and teaching leaders how to be better leaders and put people first. And so we, the, our, our horizontal is gathering more partners. We're at 40 plus now we gather. So if, that, if this resonates with you or your audience and saying, Hey, I'd like to hear more about that, then let's jump on a call. Let's talk about it. And our partnerships right now are free and you can be part of the movement and creating change. The other piece of that is helping us with getting information to the public. So sharing our posts and resharing and um, engaging with us in social media. And the final piece of it is um, donating because as a 501c3, we are constantly working to get funding. And it is a piece that you know, it's never going to stop. You're, you're constantly working to make sure that you have enough to do what you need in order to pay for all of the things that make the programs work and to give um, you enough to keep doing what you want to do to create actionable change. So those pieces are there. I think I sent you all the links for mm -hmm. that, but uh, they also can email me directly. I'm you know, I think I gave you the email or you have the email address. So mm -hmm. I'm happy to share that out and um, love to talk to anybody who this resonates with and would like to get involved in some way. Awesome. Perfect. Jason, thanks again. It's really been a pleasure. Oh, thank you. Absolutely. <laughs>